Okay, our next speaker is Nicholas Howden from the University of Bristol in the UK. He will talk about 50, or lessons from 150 years of water quality monitoring. So, the podium is yours. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me uh, here uh, today. I'm absolutely delighted, and given I've got 15 minutes, um, this, that's about a minute per decade. Um, so, <clears throat> I'll try and speak as slowly as possible. Um, but before I get going on my 150 years, um, I thought I'd just outline a few of the key questions um, that we've been trying to address um, in terms of understanding water quality and the way in which water quality has changed in our rivers uh, over the past century. So we're really interested to see how human presence and activity has changed water quality, what types of changes have occurred, and also critically over what time scales do we see the impacts of these. Um, particularly in Europe, uh, starting in the late 1990s, uh, we've been interested to try and identify what the pre-industrial baseline of water quality was because uh, we'd like to know if it's feasible to return our rivers to um, this natural state. And um, so I'm going to consider a few of those things uh, during the, the talk, um, but also to answer um, the questions that were posed about some of the key challenges for uh, hydrological science in the future in terms of water quality. I think there are a couple of things to do with the scales of measurement and our ability uh, to identify change. So 18 years ago, I arrived at Imperial College and um, uh, I went on a, a most entertaining field trip with Dennis and Howard. Um, I'm, I'm not going to tell you the story that I think they're laughing about, but um, having nearly been arrested, sorry, um, <laughs> as potential poachers um, and various other incidents, um, I particularly recall standing on this bridge with Howard whilst Dennis was looking at some runoff patterns uh, from the chalk. And um, we discussed what I was going to be doing and all the field work I was going to do during my PhD. Um, this was shortly before we had an outbreak of foot and mouth in the UK, when they effectively shut the countryside down and wouldn't allow anybody to do anything for about 18 months. Uh, this delayed the low-car program that uh, Adrian will be talking about later on, and it effectively put a kibosh on my planned field work. Um, so one of the things that I had to do during my PhD was to find alternative sources of data and information to support all the analyses I was going to do. Um, and one of the reasons that Howard had chosen the River Froome to work on was that in the 1960s there'd been a lot of attention uh, paid to the issue of um, nitrate in the River Froome. And there had been a study in the, published in the late 1970s, I think in 1979, that showed that nitrate concentrations in this chalk stream were rising at quite an alarming rate. And subsequently, based on some of the data I collected during my PhD, I managed to show that actually this rate of increase hadn't declined at all. And, uh, of course, uh, this was quite concerning. Um, so, subsequently, I started to ask myself questions about, well, how long will it rise for, where would it have been to begin with, uh, and so on and so forth. And one of the things um, that I started to look at, uh, inspired by this finding archive data, was to return to the Metropolitan Water Board archives in London uh, that hold all of the data for the River Thames. Um, now, I, Steve uh, very eloquently gave us the introduction to Bazalgette um, and his great sewer system and the beginnings of um, environmental engineering in trying to improve water quality and deal with effluents. Um, a lot of the emphasis on this actually came from the fact that in the uh, 1840s and 1850s, the House of Commons and the House of Lords had been uh, rebuilt and 500 peers had just been relocated into their nicely plush chamber. But the summer of 1858 was so hot, the stench in central London meant that they had to be relocated. And they couldn't go to work, and it was very unpleasant. So they instigated the uh, sewage treatment system, the Metropolitan Water Supply Royal Commissions, um, and 
one of the byproducts of this was that the investment was so huge at the time, they insisted that all of the water companies who were going to be set up to supply London's water in the new system had to monitor the water chemistry at their inlets. And thus, in 1866, started the world's first water quality monitoring system. So, just before I go on to talk about that data, um, one of the impacts of Bazalgette's uh, sewage system and the water treatment systems and the supply systems that they put in was this dramatic decrease in cholera outbreaks and cases of cholera. They effectively um, eliminated it by the early 1920s. Uh, this was a, a huge major achievement, uh, but it was based on a massive investment and infrastructure project that took over 40 years um, to, to come to fruition. So I'm talking about the River Thames catchment. Of course, it's 10,000 square kilometers. It's the largest catchment in the UK. Uh, I know it's very small by Canadian standards, John. Uh, sorry uh, about that. Um, but uh, and here are three time series. And I think these are what we would all consider to be quite long water quality time series. They're 30 years of data uh, starting um, back over here in 1980 and coming through to 2010. This is dissolved organic carbon. This is nitrate, it's nitrogen. And this is total phosphorus. And of course, if you look at these time series on this time scale, we can start to identify stable regimes, some seasonality, uh, maybe some trends of increase and decrease, some interesting um, sporadic events through here. Um, but if you then go back another 30 years, then that starts to put the more recent past into quite a different context. You see a completely different pattern. Uh, with the phosphorus, we start with relatively low concentrations down here. Um, uh, the nitrate, we, what we thought might have been a stable regime, isn't. There was a step change at some point in the past. Um, and our organic carbon, um, we're a lot more variable in the most recent past than we were 30 years before. Well, we can do the same again and go back another 30 years. Um, and then we start to see uh, a, a different picture again. We can see there's uh, sporadic variability in our uh, dissolved organic carbon in the early 1940s. We see an increase in seasonality in our nitrate and a step change throughout the 40s and 50s. Uh, we also see that uh, the phosphorus actually started in uh, 1936. Um, and so... That's better. In 1936, and we can see that these concentrations have risen dramatically throughout the 70s and 80s, and they've now uh, declined back to almost where they were. Um, and without laboring the point too much, we can go back uh, the whole hog to the 1860s. And then we have a, a complete picture almost of um, what has happened uh, in terms of agricultural development, in terms of individual events during the Second World War, uh, in terms of the rise of detergents, and then perhaps some influence of uh, regulation uh, in the 1990s. So what have we been doing with uh, some of these uh, data? Because whilst they're an interesting picture in themselves and they allow us to uh, put what's happening now into context, maybe have an idea about what baseline concentrations would have been uh, back in the 1800s, um, uh, we've uh, built a few models to try and understand what the time scales might be between us changing what we do uh, in our catchments to uh, what's being uh, observed at the tidal limit. So of course, we're quite concerned about nitrate fluxes um, from the terrestrial biosphere to the oceans. Uh, globally, these have doubled since pre-industrial times. Um, and so at the same time that um, the UK was starting its water quality monitoring, they also started recording what everyone was doing on the land. So 1866, the National Agricultural Survey begins, and every parish has to record uh, exactly what they use their land for, how many people worked on the land, how many animals there were. Um, and so we collated all of this data alongside the water quality data, and we started to build some simple models to try and approximate what the nitrogen loading to the land would have been, and then to compare that to what we'd been observing in the river uh, and, uh, and to see uh, how that compared. So this is the uh, net um, 
result of that, this is the total load of nitrogen that we think uh, went into the Thames catchment. This is roughly how it's distributed in terms of its percentages. Uh, so we have a large in increase in fertilizers uh, since the 1940s. We've got the effect of plowing because we had to plow half of the country uh, during World War II to produce enough food. Um, so that, that created quite a legacy. And then we've got the impacts from animals, fixation, and some atmospheric deposition as well. Um, and if we sort of combine all of that and look at the relative proportions and how these have been uh, af affecting the inputs over time, uh, we can see that fertilizers are important at the moment, but they're, they're only part of the story uh, in this latter period. So one of the things that we did was to try and understand how that might be transported through the catchment. So we allowed some of it to go um, through a sort of runoff pathway, some of it to be delayed and transported through groundwater. So this is a simple unit hydrograph type model impulse response. Um, and we allowed some proportion to go through surface water, some proportion to go through groundwater, some time delay maybe, and some attenuation factors. And what we found when we did this was that, um, in fact, th we started off assuming that there was some baseline concentration in the river, and then this baseline concentration would be added to by the impact of the, of the nitrogen load. So we uh, applied the model uh, to the catchment, and what we found uh, here, the, the key messages here, is that essentially the groundwater delay was about 30 to 32 years. So essentially that means whatever happens this year, that will occur, and you'll see the effect in the river, in 32 years' time. So, um, also, 50% of what we see in the river comes through the groundwater. So, if we're looking to try and improve or reduce our nitrogen concentrations, um, we're already going to have a 50% diminishing return uh, in any given year. We're going to have to wait three decades to see that sort of improvement. Um, and we also managed to find that the nitrate baseline in the river, if there was no agricultural activity and there were no sewage inputs, uh, would be of the order of 0.55 to 0.7, so less than one milligram per litre. So an awful lot lower than they are at the moment and have been uh, for the majority of, of the last century. One of the things that um, came out of this work was, was that we started to look at the nitrogen balance of, of the catchment. And uh, this has been done uh, in the US as well. Nandita Basu has been working on a similar uh, area. But if we simply take our inputs and outputs and accumulate them over time, um, we, we assume that pre-1940 that we were in some kind of equilibrium. So if we bring this down uh, to our x-axis here, we find that since 1940, we've been massively accumulating nitrogen somewhere in our catchment that we can't really account for. And so we have this huge legacy store waiting for us uh, to come out somewhere in the future, which is of, of some concern. Um, more recently, we've been looking at trying to uh, apply some of uh, the safe toolbox tools that Torsten mentioned earlier on to um, get an understanding of how we might go about parameterizing these models um, if we wanted to apply them elsewhere, what sorts of things would we look for? Because obviously when you're working with historical data uh, and you want to find out what happened in the 1920s, it's not easy to go out and take samples. Uh, we have to use some kind of nuanced modeling tool to understand what sorts of things we might uh, want to look for and how we might get the information. Um, we have been uh, applying the model uh, elsewhere to other long-term catchments where we have some data uh, with some success. Without going into too much detail, because I know I'm, I'm a little pushed for time, um, we've also been looking at our dissolved organic carbon uh, time series, and we've been building some models of the carbon export uh, from the Thames catchment, looking at the impact of soils, of growing populations, and of the land use transitions that have taken place due to plowing or due to the conversion of arable to permanent grassland and so on. And what we see, um, really, in summary, is that the long-term trend in dissolved organic carbon uh, in the Thames for the last 140 years is predominantly driven by the number of people in the catchment. The variability that we see is um, sporadic, and that's really due to land use transitions. So this is due to the massive plowing of permanent pasture during World War II. Uh, there are certain periods when we see um, some uh, carbon storage taking place. Uh, but these are small compared uh, with the amount of carbon uh, that's being released. 
And perhaps one of the sort of uh, recent issues to do with global browning and the questions about dissolved organic carbon export, it's a little concerning that we've got more and more people living in these large cities. There aren't many DOC studies on lowland catchments that are not peat covered, uh, but we're certainly, we've certainly seen a trend whereby the organic carbon concentrations have, have, have more than doubled um, since the late 1800s. We've also started to uh, just recently to build some models to try and understand what was going on uh, with the phosphorus. Uh, this is work with uh, Helen Jarvie um, at CEH in Wallingford. And we started to look at the components of the effluent uh, that might be contributing and also uh, the phosphorus inputs to the land in a similar way that we did uh, with the nitrogen. Uh, so there is some very good news on the phosphorus story. Um, so if I just take the annual mean um, phosphorus concentration here that's plotted in red and uh, here in blue is our estimated net loading to the river from uh, the sewage effluent from the discharges and you can see here the moment that tertiary treatment uh, comes in from the EU Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive we see a dramatic decline in our phosphorus export so that's really good news uh, in our river and I think that was reflected earlier on in, um, in an earlier talk. However if we look at the long-term phosphorus budget, we see a slightly different story. So uh, we were working with Steve Powers from Notre Dame and the University of uh, Washington, and uh, he had some interesting data from the Miami and the Yangtze Basin, and we tried to do a phosphorus uh, balance for all of these three catchments. And what we found was uh, this is actually the net input uh, of phosphorus in the Thames in red, the Miami in uh, green, and black uh, is the Yangtze. And so you can see that over time, the net input of phosphorus to the Thames is declining, and it is for the Moame. However, for the Yangtze, it's simply going through the roof. And just to highlight, this is the accumulation of this over time. So we can see that the Thames catchment has sort of reached a turning point, and it's probably on its way down. Uh, so is the Moami, hopefully. Uh, but the Yangtze is on a very strong, steep, upward trajectory. And for those of you at the back who can't see, the black line is actually divided by 100. So um, this is a, a very, very large uh, increase in phosphorus storage. And at the moment, we're trying to, to disaggregate our phosphorus budgets and try and understand exactly where all of this phosphorus is going. So having talked about the Thames, which for us in the UK is quite large scale, um, I just wanted to touch on a couple of other pieces of work uh, and things that we're thinking about uh, for the future, because we've had some discussions about uh, the scale at which we want to be doing our hydrological monitoring and, and our modeling and the scale at which we want to try and understand processes. And in terms of water chemistry, and particularly in understanding mass fluxes uh, from catchments, the vast majority of our large catchments are actually comprised of lots of um, first and second order streams. And these sometimes make up to 95% of the catchment area. So the sort of uh, the chemical processing that's going on is going on in these small headwater catchments. And so they remain really important uh, for what happens at the tidal limit. Uh, and understanding the export of water and nutrients from these small catchments is really crucial for us to understand what's going to happen at larger scales if we want to have management interventions to change that export. So one of the counters to this is that most of our national monitoring schemes where we have really good data sets are actually on the main river and they don't really capture any of this variability. So to just give you a brief example from, from Brittany, um, this is a, a set of questions that we posed about well, how, how do we monitor what's going on in terms of water quality in some of these catchments? Because if we're at a small catchment scale, we have a huge amount of variability in what we see. And clearly, there are different processes occurring, and we need to understand what these are, because this is the scale at which we would implement a program of measures to try and reduce overall export. Um, and so trying to... Uh, understand what these critical scales are and how we need to approach this work is, is really important. And at the same time, given that we've identified these large legacy stores um, that are in our catchments, it's important that we understand how these two things uh, interplay against each other in determining what that export is. And finally, one of the ways in which 
Um, we interact with the biogeochemical community and particularly with the, the land managers um, is to provide estimates of fluvial fluxes so that we can try and understand whether what our catchments are exporting is going up, is going down, or is staying the same. And this is going to be really important to be proving to government or regulatory agencies that if they implement a program of measures and try and make some changes to what they do uh, on the land and in their catchments, that we can actually detect that change. And um, I know that uh, Howard asked for some thoughts about uh, what the challenges were going to be in the future. So I'm, it's the only, uh, it's the largest equation that I'm going to present. Um, and, uh, but I, I think this is going to be fairly important because the, our ability to say that we have done something in our catchments and we have observed a change that is significant is based on our ability to actually analyze that data and come up with appropriate statistics to prove that. So the order covariance function of the series that's a product between concentration and flow, it's crucial that we understand the statistics of that function to be able to say, yes, we have actually enacted a change. We have changed the structure of the fluxes that are coming out of here. Now, Richard mentioned yesterday that quite often we assume that we've got normal distributions and we assume that we have independent series. Um, and uh, so if you have a normal distribution for both series, you have two time series multiplied together. If they're both normally distributed and the two series are independent, then the autocovariance function of the series that's a product of two time series is given by that simple equation. The square of the mean of one times it's the covariance function of the other multiplied uh, by the same vice versa. However, if we do not have normal distributions and they're not independent, which flow series are not and chemistry time series are not most definitely, then that all of a sudden becomes... Um, the function that you have to deal with. And without going into too much detail, the flux series, which is the product of flow and concentration, for that to be stationary, the component series, the flow and the concentration, need to be stationary in their first, second, third, and fourth moments. And this is a, a huge ask because we know that our series are not stationary and therefore trying to estimate whether our fluxes have changed significantly and whether anything that we do in our catchments has been effective is going to be a challenge unless we address um, how we characterize our chemical fluxes with high quality flow data and high quality concentration data. So just a few conclusions. Um, we've seen that human activities have caused significant disruption to N, C, and P cycles. We've seen trends, we've seen increased variability, we've seen step changes, and we've seen altered biogeochemical regimes. Some of these changes are reversible, as we've seen with the phosphorus story, um, but over what time scale? If we're going to have a significant impact on our nitrogen concentrations, that could take many decades to take effect. Um, it's important that we have some good sensitivity and uncertainty analyses uh, in order to inform our modelings because we don't necessarily have the data that we need in order to uh, build comprehensive models uh, of these systems. Um, for the future, there's some serious questions about scales of measurement and to try and balance that need for process understanding and to uh, demonstrate the effectiveness of intervention measures. Uh, and to target our future uh, effort in terms of modeling and monitoring. And uh, finally, the detection and attribution of change, uh, I think, is going to be really crucial, and it's important that we improve the methods that we have available uh, in order to do that. So, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the great talk. It was really fantastic. My question is uh, on the nitrogen part. So 32 year, 30 to 32 years, and Philip also here, and, <laughs> and uh, 30 to 32 years uh, travel time for nitrogen. Did you have any supplementary data such as tracer or isotope to calibrate these 30 to 32 years? No, but... We, um, we've applied the same model to other catchments in the UK, mm -hmm. where it, it effectively this, this, this change in input, um, the Second World War, 
um, when we ploughed up the grassland. If you view that as being a, a, a national scale tracer test, um, effectively, this ploughing happened nearly everywhere. And um, in a number of catchments where we have the monitoring data, it's, it's, it, you, you see a similar scale of travel time. Mm -hmm. So um, in another catchment, it was 37 years. In another one, it's about 40 years. Somewhere else, it was sort of 28, 29 years, depending upon the, the aquifer system. Yeah, because um, uh, from, hydro from my hydrology perspective, that bell shape that we call it piston flow transit time model that you used, May not capture, uh, may may uh, may capture travel time much more longer than the realistic one because you ignored a high percentage of young early uh, release ni nitrogen. Um, so that's why I asked this question. Maybe using some uh, more enhanced because hydrology over the last years uh, had improvements on developing new transit time travel time model that might be useful for nitrogen at the University of Waterloo. Now they are using that. So and maybe a better understanding of these lag time, legacy time might be useful for policy. That, uh, that's your main concern as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for the talk. Okay. Thank you.